welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And I'm not even going to ask what your good thing was this week because I know it was the Wheel of Time. <laughs> I mean, I did I did say that it was going to be my good thing this week in our last episode. And lo and behold, seeing the first two episodes at the advanced screening in San Francisco was indeed my good thing for this week. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Me too. There's always that worry, you know, when you build something up in your head. Mm -hmm. that it's going to be a letdown. But more on that later, because we will see the return of the Wheel of Time check-in. Yes, but it is going to be behind a spoiler wall for anyone who has not seen, is it the first two episodes of the TV show? It's the first two episodes, yeah. By the time this recording is released, the third episode will be live, but obviously I haven't seen that yet. (laughs) But that's a short enough timeline that I feel like we can give people a minute to catch up. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And your good thing, Lily? I didn't actually plan for this in advance. Uh, Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, you know, my good thing is a work in progress. (laughs) But uh, we recently, uh, this is a work good thing, which I usually try to avoid because no one wants to hear about that during their fun time. But I got to fire a client (laughs) and it's actually not flattering how gleeful I am about it (laughs) I mean I I think it's earned though that glee oh you have had to put up with me complaining about them for a very long time (laughs) multiple years of making my life miserable I think I'm about as gleeful as you probably that's not true yeah no that's not true (laughs) but I I have an element of glee there too I'm very happy for you. The only reason why this is not a complete celebration is that, you know, we're not the bad guys. We gave them like three months notice, which means now this is just that awkward middle time where they're realizing how absolutely fucked they are and maybe they should have been nicer to me. (laughs) So that's great. (laughs) They're lost. Meetings are super awkward, though. Just like looking at the dread on their faces is kind of (laughs) nice. I told you, this doesn't make me look good. <laughs> no, but it's understandable. Or at least I find it understandable. But as you said, I've I've heard your complaints for a number of years now. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot about this client, but I'm just going to leave one gem, which is that one of the members of their team did try to get me fired a year and a half ago. Like actually said those words to their bosses that I should not have my job. So, you know... <laughs> They can suck it. <laughs> There's a little bit of karma there. Right? Oh, you don't, you don't want me to work on this account? Too bad. Great. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> so that's going to be awesome in a month and a half when they're actually gone. <laughs> so it's just kind of in the weird in-between. So that's, that was my very long work rant that I just said I wouldn't go on. <laughs> that's why I don't bring it up because I know I'll just go on about it forever. And that's not actually what this podcast is about. (laughs) (laughs) But before we get to book talk, Sarah, what are you drinking tonight? I made myself a honey rum fizz because it sounded appropriately festive. That sounds like something I would drink. It is something that you would drink. I think you would like it a lot, actually. I'm enjoying it. I probably wouldn't go out of my way to make it again, but I wouldn't like not drink it <laughs> <laughs> a resounding uh <laughs> recommendation it's it's a little sweet for me yeah but not not so sweet that i can't drink it it does sound like i would like it quite a bit <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think you would um and it's actually not very difficult to make you just need rum honey water and prosecco or some sort of sparkling you're saying you need honey rum and something that fizzes <laughs> <laughs> yeah or, or some kind of sparkling wine that does sound delicious. Oh, and apple juice. You need a little bit of apple juice. Oh, uh, well, that's much fancier than what I'm drinking. <laughs> <laughs> what are you drinking? Well, my parents are in town, which means my mother has provided me with boxed Costco brand Pinot Grigio. So basically, it's just any other day recording. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got it from somewhere, okay? <laughs> hey, no, no shame for the box wine. Box wine is great. Yeah, no. It's just I don't usually have the guts to brave Costco. Oh, you mean you you normally buy it from elsewhere? 
Yes. Gotcha. It's the Costco brand that's making it <laughs> exceptional. Okay. Okay. I see. <laughs> I wasn't sure where the emphasis was in that statement. Now uh, I know. Yeah, no, it's the fact that it's Kirkland's signature. I, you know, Costco scares me a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I piggyback off of my stepfather's visit to Costco every week. <laughs> yeah, it takes it, it takes at least a week of like talking myself up to be able to brave that place. He does it every week. Ugh. Like clockwork. Well, Sarah, have you read anything good lately? I haven't had a time or the chance to read non-podcast books because I read in preparation for this episode. I read 7 <laughs> Old Kingdom books by Garth Neck. Well, six Old Kingdom books and one collection of short stories that included 137 pages of Old Kingdom content. I would like to clarify that that was your choice <laughs> and that we did not plan seven books for one podcast episode. So I think actually uh, you read five books for yourself that just happened to be related to the podcast content. We did. I, I No, I, in my defense... I mean, yes, this was a totally irrational choice I didn't have to make, but we had talked about rereading all of the earlier Old Kingdom books so that we had that fresh in our heads for this episode. And of course, life got in the way as it does, and neither of us read it in any kind of timely manner. So yeah, but you actually did it. <laughs> <laughs> I had two days off of work, Oh, which is the only well, reason that's how why. You did yeah. It. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm less appalled. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't trying to fit in work and reading this, but it was still a lot to read in a short amount of time. Yeah. Especially most of the other books were okay because they were ranged in like the 350 to 450 page range. I didn't realize that the copy of Lyriel that I had was 700 pages. I didn't realize it was that long either. Yeah. Damn. So I was like, oh, I can I can read this. No problem. And I'll have time to start on abortion. It's fine. No, <laughs> it was 700 pages. <laughs> anyway. I mean, they're good books. They are good books. It was a delight to read, but I feel like I'm jumping ahead to the, to the book <laughs> content that will make up the bulk of this episode before I'm supposed to actually talk about that. So uh, we've never done that before. <laughs> never. This is a first in the history of the podcast. It's true. Have you read anything good lately? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, nothing irrelevant. <laughs> it's all been podcast related. I didn't even read all the books I was supposed to read for today. <laughs> <laughs> Oopsies. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, but so, okay, that means that between the two of us, we average out. <laughs> there you go. I like that. I like that quite a bit. Uh, but, you know, I, I edited today's episode on time or last week's episode on time. However time works. The episode that came out the day that we're recording this. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> I, my parents are in town. I had better stuff to do. I'll admit it. <laughs> I mean, fair. <laughs> and when you're in town, I'll also have better stuff to do. Oh, is that a spoiler? I don't think we've announced it anywhere yet, but... Like anyone else cares <laughs> that we're going to do a recording in person together. It's not going to change anything. <laughs> It's not. I mean, it might actually be more chaotic. Oh, it's going to be a mess. I love yeah. it. I already love it. <laughs> to avoid spoilers for the Wheel of Time TV series, skip to 1645. So you promised me Wheel of Time check-in. Yeah, there's. we've got a Wheel of Time check-in. <laughs> back to our roots. <laughs> it feels good to be coming back after... Uh, a long hiatus, but as I have said, I did get to see the first two episodes at an advanced screening. How did you swing that? Uh, the Wheel of Time announced that they were doing advanced screenings to coincide with the UK premiere red carpet event. So they had things um, in, I think, 10 cities in the US. San Francisco was one of them. Tickets were free. So I got a ticket and I went and it was great. I really enjoyed it. Overall, I was very happy with the show. There is a kind of very major change to Perrin's origin story that I'm on the fence about. Like, I think so for, for most of the changes that have been made that I've seen thus far, like, because they really condense the plot of 
the series. Mm-hmm. I think the first season is supposed to cover like the first three books. Oh shit. So by the by the end of episode <laughs> two, we're like halfway through book one already. Yeah. So they they're obviously like they're condensing a ton of stuff, but I think that that makes for kind of a more enjoyable series because you don't need to watch them travel in a caravan for you know 500 pages right (laughs) just give me give me that lord of the rings montage (laughs) exactly (laughs) but they made this one change to Perrin's backstory they gave him a wife in two rivers which is not something that he has in the books aren't they like 16 well they they've aged them up in the tv show but then how are they gonna justify all the dumb shit they do I mean, you know, 19-year-olds still do dumb shit. All right. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, but so so they gave him a wife. And then there's an invasion of Trollocs, who are kind of like the the Wheel of Time equivalent of orcs or the Urukai or whatever. Trolls. For context for you. Yeah. Never would have guessed. I know. It's, it's not there in the name whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but the Trollocs invade the two rivers their hometown their home village and in the fight Perrin is fighting a Trolloc they're both in his blacksmith's forge or something and he's really raging on this Trolloc and his wife comes up behind him and he turns around and he hits her with his axe and he kills her what and on the one hand, I think it makes sense because it really helps explain or it provides backstory for his attitudes towards like bladed weapons, which he's really reluctant to use in the series, and his reluctance to like kind of embrace his strength. He's really focused for most of the book series, he's really focused on like, you know, being in control of himself. Mm-hmm. And this provides a reason for that. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense from that perspective, but also like, wow, the fridging. Yeah. So that was, I don't know how I feel about that particular change. I think that in terms of other characters, I really like how they expanded on like Matt's family situation where they have made it so that like his parents don't really have a lot of money. His, his mother is an alcoholic and his dad is a womanizer. And he's trying to provide for his two sisters. So Mm -hmm. it makes sense that he would be so focused on like gold and accumulating coin. And instead of just being a and d character. Yeah. And it it even helps kind of explain things for he picks up this cursed dagger in this cursed city. And it it makes it a little more than just like, ooh, shiny, you Mm -hmm. know, it's still a really dumb thing. But it, it explains his motivations a little bit better than the book does. Well, if he's 19, he has to have a reason. If he's <laughs> yeah. 16, it's okay if it, there's no reason. Because who had a reason to do anything when they were 16? I mean, there's there's a world of difference between 16-year-olds and 19-year-olds. No, but but I do think that it... Um... I mean, yes, but also. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I, I, like, I do think that it, it helps flesh out his motivations and, and adds a little bit more nuance to his character. Mm-hmm. So I like that. I'm really sad that Barney Harris, who plays Matt, was recast because he was fantastic in these first two episodes. Did they recast him for season two? Or Yeah, he's he's been recast for season two. That feels quick. No one has said why. So we huh. don't know if it was his decision, the studio's decision, or what. I um, can't imagine an actor would say, no, no, I don't want the steady paycheck. <laughs> I mean, he. it could be that he just didn't like Prague or he didn't like being away from his family for that long or, you know, I like there, I think there are reasons. You're right. There, there are reasons and I will not speculate. Yeah. All right. So I don't know, but he was great. I liked him a lot as Matt. Do you think they're going to have a line in the first episode of season two where it's like, oh, Matt, you got a nose job. <laughs> I think, well, it's actually in terms of recasting characters matt makes a lot of sense because he goes through this incredibly traumatic experience with the dagger where he's kind of fundamentally changed it's not i mean in the in the books it's not his outward appearance that gets changed but there is a lot of change there so i think that they could wrap up that transition 
and like kind of hand wave it away with it was the dagger and the healing from the dagger that caused this you know transformation I feel like we are getting a little bit too deep into Wheel of Time. <laughs> we are probably getting too deep into Wheel of Time. Only because we are going to have some kind of dedicated episode to it. And uh, I, d- I don't want us to just repeat everything. Well, we could actually just repeat everything word for word and then boom, <laughs> double the content. <laughs> but that feels like a cop out. I mean, you'd probably enjoy it because then you wouldn't necessarily have to talk about wheel of time as oh much. i can come up with new <laughs> uh new ways to make fun of it don't you worry <laughs> oh good <laughs> anyway that's those are those are my very quick thoughts on the first two episodes so you watched the first two episodes sounds like you're excited for episode three yes and that is all anyone can ask for yeah i am i mean I'm going to watch the show. I don't think I'm going to hate the show. I'm going to be honest. I, I actually, no, I, I don't think you're going to hate the show. I mean. But that's because the show is <laughs> going to go so much faster. The show is going to go a lot faster. I think some critics were complaining about pacing issues. I didn't have that issue with the two episodes. As in it should have gone even <laughs> faster, in which case. I think, no, I just, just <laughs> that they felt it was uneven. I didn't feel like that, but. Well, as long as it doesn't take me. 14 500 page books i think i'll be okay with it 14 like 700 page books actually <laughs> you are cementing my decision <laughs> i know <laughs> i no i i think you will enjoy the show i won't make you read the books oh that that was never an option on the table <laughs> that's not i never say never uh i currently have no intention of ever reading those books but i think the show's gonna be cool so yeah that it'll be great. <laughs> Stay it tuned. Will be great. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I have a lot of emotions about these books. <laughs> I do too. It was good to come back to the old kingdom. I gotta say, I really hate that series name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. It just doesn't capture anything about the books at all. <laughs> It's so bland. The books take place in the Old Kingdom. That's, that's it's descriptive in that sense. Blandest sun. fucking man I've <laughs> ever heard. Like you just described all of Europe. I it's mean, an this Old is, Kingdom. This is this is fantasy Scotland. Sure, but... <laughs> but how do I know that from the name Old Kingdom? I don't. <laughs> this is true. I don't. I don't have issues with it being called the Old Kingdom. I just think it undersells the series. Old Kingdom does not say necromancer bullshit, which I love. They should have named the series necromancer bullshit. It would have been so much better. <laughs> to be fair, none of the book titles say necromancer bullshit either. No, but at least Sabriel makes you ask questions. I mean, Old Kingdom is like, yeah, I own that history book. <laughs> it makes me think Egypt, actually. Yeah. Okay. So you agree with me? <laughs> I No, I like it. I like thinking Egypt. That doesn't have anything to do with the series. No. I guess mummies are tangentially related to the undead, but not actually <laughs> they at could, all. They could be. They don't say there are no mummies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, other than my great complaints over the series name Old Kingdom, I have always referred to it as the Aberson series, and I will continue to do so because that's better, which is a series of books by Garth Nix about necromancers but they're the the protector necromancers so they do death magic but to prevent the dead from rising and i love that so much and they have a bunch of bells (laughs) and they ring the bells and it's so good there are good necromancers and bad necromancers and the abortion are the good necromancers also you should note listener that lily and i pronounce that word differently we don't know who is right we have never heard this word spoken aloud by people other than us. Oh, I mean, I think you're right, but I will still insist on pronouncing it my way. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I want to think that I'm right because that's how I pronounce it. But yeah. also, in the interest of fairness, you could be right. <laughs> it is theoretically possible. <laughs> I appreciate that you're giving me the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> but like, I agree with you. I just am choosing to pronounce it wrong, which, spoiler alert. We're going to get to later. (laughs) But before we get to purposefully mispronouncing words, is there an elder young adult genre 
is that a thing? I don't I don't think it's a thing. If it was a thing, this would fall into it. I think for me, this feels like traditional young adult versus contemporary young adult. Not, and I don't mean that in terms of setting, just in terms of tone. Tone, yeah. Tone and a little bit writing style mm-hmm. and like the the arc of the book or the arc of the story. Yeah. So I guess <laughs> all of our dithering earlier did not actually explain <laughs> that the Old Kingdom, even if it's a bad series name, <laughs> refers to a series of six books by Garth Nix. The first one of which is Sabriel. There's the original trilogy, which came out in, or the first of which came out in 95, I think, 1995. I was going to say 96, but same thing. I think it's 96, but yeah, whatever. Sabriel, Lyriel, Aberson. And then more recently, there have been Clarial, Golden Hand, and Tercial and Eleanor. That's one book. Torsiel and Eleanor. That's the one that came out this year. That's why we're having this conversation. I didn't read that one. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Torsiel and Eleanor came out at the beginning of November. I think the publication date was November 2nd. We were like, let's have a really topical and timely podcast episode. And then I said, well, I'm going to read Golden Hand and then uh, just nurse my lady boner for Touchstone the entire time and not even pay attention to the actual new book. <laughs> That does feel in character for you. (laughs) I mean, it is. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Dashing all of my plans of having a topical episode. It's moderately topical still. I mean, we're still going to talk about it. (laughs) We are. (laughs) I'm just not going to be helpful at all, which is also in character. (laughs) Keeping true to theme. Yeah, I know. (laughs) But anyway, as far as genre goes, I would say this is young adult, but I feel like that genre title has baggage. I I think the phrase young adult has expanded to a much wider age range, whereas this is like, I think a young adult would like this book instead of, I think this would be in the young adult section of a bookstore, if that makes sense. No, that does not make sense to me. I think the young adult genre... I get, no, I guess I read it in middle school. I It just feels darker. I don't know. It's, it's got creepy death stuff. Mm, I disagree with you there. I mean, not about the creepy death stuff. It has a lot of that. But I think that a lot of young adult nowadays deals with heavy themes like creepy death stuff. Okay. So in that respect, I don't think it's different. Well, you had agreed with me before when I said elder young adult. So why do you think that's true? (laughs) So it's, so it's, again, it's not so much the themes of the book or the content as it is the style in which it is written and the arcs of the plot and like how, how the plot actually progresses and what points it hits. Okay. Okay. I agree with the plot. I mean, I agree with the prose as well. I think the, the prose is, I mean, it, it's not over the top complex, but it's definitely more sophisticated than some quote unquote young adult novels that I've it, read. It feels, it feels a little, I'm going to say old fashioned. I don't mean this in any kind of negative sense of the word, but it feels, it feels a little old fashioned or traditional versus a more contemporary kind of very terse writing style it plays with it it, the book the author (laughs) plays with language uh in a way that i really love the the sentences are complex and varied and have different clause structures and it's really just a a joy to read from a linguistic perspective and it's not tolkien but it's good it's it's beautifully written and very enjoyable and like I said, my comment about it feeling more old fashioned is not, from my perspective, any kind of, of negative mark against it whatsoever. I, I think I would use the word complex, but I think we're saying the same thing. I think we're probably saying the same thing. That was something I learned today. Did not realize that Nix was Australian, but uh, good for him, I guess. <laughs> I never realized I discovered he was Australian because we follow him on Twitter oh, good on for the podcast. 
<laughs> but reading these books, I'd always thought that he was English because, or, or British, because... Because there's a kilt? Well, because I always read Anne Celestier as England and the Old Kingdom as Scotland. I... Interesting. I mean, there are kilts, so I can't argue against you. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't even the kilts that made me think that. Um, okay. I don't know. It was. We're saying kilts plural, as if there's more than the <laughs> just touchstone. <laughs> Who wears a kilt? Maybe there is in Clarial, which I have not read. I don't think there are kilts in Clarial. So it really is just Bay Touchstone. It is just Touchstone. Yeah. He tries to get his son to wear a kilt, and his son says no. Well, <laughs> that sounds like a him problem. <laughs> I didn't think it was that direct. It felt more to me like a, I mean, it, it's a vague fantasy world, but it's a very specific vague fantasy world. The universe that Nyx has built is so absorbing in every way. There is a divide between Ancelstier and the old kingdom the old kingdom uh he could have come up with a better name i'll stop complaining I like about it, it I, promise. I like it <laughs> so as i was saying there are two lands and one is the land of like magic in whoa yeah one is the land of magic the other is the land of like mid industrial revolution they have some like propeller planes they have telegrams Telegraphs? Telegram? Telegrams. Wait, yeah. what's the difference between a telegraph and a telegram? Are those the same thing? Does one of those not exist? The Dire Straits have a song called Telegraph Road. So there is a telegraph. But it, maybe one's the machine and one is the message. Actually, I think that's what it is. A telegraph is a device for transmitting uh, and receiving messages over long distance. And the telegram telegraph, is the message. A telegraph message was known as a telegram. Hey, I figured it out. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have both of those in Encelstelier. Cannot pronounce that name if without looking at it. Where is it? It's in our notes somewhere. It is Encelstier. In our notes. All right. I said it. I got there eventually. <laughs> There's such an incredible push and pull between those two worlds we're introduced to it with sabriel in school sabriel being the main character of the first book and inheriting the aberson power as being the sort of necromancer protector she goes to school in the technology world and she has to be sort of reintroduced to the magic land and that's very fun i clearly imprinted on sabriel more than i realized <laughs> Just even when we were talking about it last week. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I direct all listeners to uh, go listen to our discussion on Sphere, or the episode Sphere, because at the very beginning, we talk about how I was reading Sabriel, and Lily chimes in with very concrete details about Touchstone, who is the love interest in that book, and his introduction, and like his character well, arc and his dick <laughs> and his dick <laughs> let's not give me too much credit and you have you have not read that book in a long time i mean over a decade yeah so i was really impressed that you had all of that knowledge in your head like i feel like these books were influential for me too as a reader but i did not remember those specific details at all i i think part of that is just that we we read books differently well, that's true too yeah, so like, I don't, I don't, just because I have weird details stuck <laughs> in my head, I don't think that means that much. But there were definitely moments. So I read Golden Hand, which was the fourth book chronologically, not by publishing date. It was the fifth book as published. But yes, chronologically, it's actually the sixth book. Wait. Clarial's first and Tercial and Eleanor takes place before Sabriel. Oh, okay, there's two sequels. <laughs> Sabriel is the first book <laughs> as published. And then Golden Hand is the fourth one after that. But then there's two prequels, even though they were published later. It doesn't matter. This is worse than Star Wars. <laughs> but I did start reading that. Well, I, I've read it 
actually, I did read one book for today. (laughs) And I was sort of amazed with how much of this series of this world I had internalized. I've, I've read the original three novels several times in my, in the, in my youth (laughs) back in the day. And I knew I loved them, but I didn't realize how many details I had truly absorbed in in an incredibly meaningful way. (laughs) I don't talk about writing a lot on this podcast because that's not what it's about, but uh, oops, Sure didn't rip a lot. <laughs> books <laughs> that I it's did not, not realize I was it's doing. Not, it's not ripping. It's an homage. There you go. Is it? Is it a rip off? If you didn't know you were doing it, <laughs> and it's nothing specific, but there's a lot of ambiance shit that I had apparently just taken in as part of myself. <laughs> and reading Golden Hand or reading and just any of the old kingdom books for the first time in so long felt so beautifully nostalgic in such a wonderful way. I have almost no commentary on the actual events of Golden Hand because I was just soaking in the world so much. I loved it every second. And it's also really nice to have a book that was so important to you as a child or so important that's a general you to yeah. one as a child I mean also um, me but yes <laughs> also also you yeah. I mean also me too but yeah um and have it still stand up when you read it as an adult yes I would almost say it's bad well okay I haven't reread the original three but the series the world golden hand <laughs> that's gonna be my my touchstone (laughs) in this episode as the one I've read most recently but I don't think I really understood the impressiveness with the number of female characters (laughs) do you remember reading it as a kid and going wow this author really is incorporating a lot of well-written female characters what a good job like that's, no no because that's not <laughs> something you considered as a child no and, but it's definitely something that I consider as an adult especially when you compare it to recent books that we've read like Sphere <laughs> to be to be fair Sphere was written before these were but still but for a series that started in the mid 90s Mm-hmm. it's still very impressive and I did not appreciate that at the time well I don't think I I well I definitely didn't consciously appreciate it at the time but I'm sure that's a factor for why I embraced it so heavily mm-hmm. yeah I mean a good job like Nix shit <laughs> <laughs> You're right, though. Being able to come back to a series that you loved so much and feeling justified Mm -hmm. (laughs) is a really nice experience. Like feeling feeling like it holds up. Yeah. I mean, as as I've said, I did reread the first. I had read the first three books like you. I had read the first Mm -hmm. three books. I hadn't been aware until recently that he had continued the series with Clariel, Golden Hand, and then Tercial and Eleanor, because there was that long 11-year gap. So it just, I reread those first three books for this episode, and it was really comforting to fall into them and to enjoy the same things that I enjoyed as a child, but to recognize, like to, to look at it with older eyes and recognize where he was doing things differently from other writers just in terms of the strength of his female characters i agree 100 percent. being able to well i didn't reread the original trilogy but i remember it <laughs> clearly <laughs> clearly pretty well you were you remembered it better than i did prior to rereading and i assume i mean you can correct me if i'm wrong but golden hand is not a dramatic left turn from those three yeah no I mean all of all of the books even though there is this big gap in in publication date all of the books felt very cohesive that was the feeling I had as well but I did not have uh the reading to back it up (laughs) you You didn't have all of the context (laughs) 
I only had feelings, <laughs> but my feelings are right. It's so nice to not feel like you have to wear nostalgia goggles mm -hmm. because there are definitely books that I reread that I put on my nostalgia goggles for, and I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. You know, books mean something to you and they can bring emotions back up and you can still feel very good about a book, even if you can, as an adult or modern person recognize. recognize some of the flaws exactly but not these books or you don't have to you know what I mean obviously <laughs> yeah. that was a compliment yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also you know it was interesting because there were some aspects of of the books that I just don't think that I appreciated when I was a child like I didn't I don't think that I really recognized how frank it was about dealing with things like bodies mm -hmm. you know because there's there's a comment in sabriel about how she went to a spirit for advice when she got her period mm -hmm. and like that's just something that i think i glossed over or didn't it it didn't really i didn't really notice when i was reading as a kid um but that i definitely appreciated coming back to the series but isn't that something I bet we did appreciate it as a kid? It was just subconscious. Like I mean, yeah, but I guess that that's not necessarily against what I'm saying. No, right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's something we can yeah. articulate now. It's something we notice now. Yeah. But would this series have meant so much to us if it didn't do these things? Probably not. We just didn't realize what it was. It was just another incredible book, but it has held this test of time i i think that it i think it would probably still mean things because even without that discussion or that acknowledgement the female characters are still great oh and there's and they're still better than okay a lot of the other not that specifically yeah. but i i was referring to that as a symptom of the overall greatness of the yeah books. okay <laughs> okay <laughs> and just because we we didn't realize how unique they were at the time or at least I certainly didn't mm -hmm. it was just a great book series that I absolutely loved and now I'm realizing why I loved it so much and how truly special it was mm -hmm. speaking of how wonderful these books are Sarah did I trick you into reading another horror book <laughs> <laughs> I I think you could make an argument that it's horror, but I don't find it scary. So that's that's my like line in the sand. Do I yeah. find it scary? I mean, I agree with you. I don't think these books are horror genre. I wrote the literal words in our notes. They have ooky spooky vibes. I mean, okay. <laughs> I want I want to argue something for myself. Okay. I worked at the bone room. Like I worked in a place that that sold bones and things like that. Like it's not ooky spooky vibes don't bother me. I've, clearly not. I worked in the store that that sold ooky spooky vibes. I am using you as a reference point for the difference between <laughs> ooky spooky and horror. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry for using you. You're more than a reference. <laughs> I just wanted to defend myself just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. No, but I. I guess I obviously I knew that about you. You're not squeamish, <laughs> clearly. Yeah. <laughs> but there is absolutely a difference between the horror genre and ooky spooky vibes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this is not the series for you if you don't like dead bodies. And there there is gore. Yeah, there there are a lot of dead bodies. It's not necessarily extremely explicit, but it's there. Yeah, and there, there's like some kind of, well, again, I read one of them very recently. <laughs> I'm going off of my memory for the rest, but there's some body horror. There are monsters that are monstrous people, as in, you know, people who have been killed and brought back to life, and they have been mutated through that process, and they've got all kinds of crazy limbs and teeth and stuff happening and and things not necessarily in the right proportions that we expect yeah which is very ooky spooky <laughs> <laughs> i just wouldn't call it horrific 
Yeah. Horror. I mean, I... I'm making hand gestures. <laughs> it's not horror. <laughs> <laughs> that's very helpful for our listeners. Yeah, that's why I had to overpronounce the word. If I go horror, that's how you know I'm making a hand gesture. <laughs> add that to the list of words i mispronounce on purpose (laughs) we're getting a little ahead of ourselves there it's gonna be a good segment though (laughs) it will be but it's not gonna be as good as the world building in the series oh that fucking segue you nailed it i was trying to figure out how we were gonna get there (laughs) but also bam if that's not true the the first book sabriel the first book published <laughs> Sabriel, <laughs> introduces the concept of necromancers the concept of the aberson who is a necromancer that prevents necromancers from doing necromancy <laughs> i can i just say i love that concept of someone who participates in this dark magic in order to make it right like that is just so I don't have words for it. I, I really, Very I really good. think it's. I really think it's interesting though how the abortion does it because the abortion balances the free magic, which is the the uncontrollable like bad magic that will eventually kind of like rot away your your goodness, and the charter magic, which is the very ordered magic. And that's the reason why, like, they're they're always in this balance. And that's the reason why they can use necromancy successfully. Right. There, there are lots of charter mages, but all necromancers are free magic, except for the Aberson, who is yeah. the, the person who is keeping them in check. And we sort of follow, Sabriel is the first one who is, I think, a student at the time of the book. Yeah, she she starts off as a student at a girls' college. Sorry, I should have said Aberson in waiting. Oh. A student of the Aberson, <laughs> yes. specifically. Yes. <laughs> also a student at a school, but that's less relevant. But we do actually tend to follow the up-and-coming Abersons and not the established, well, because that's less fun, right? There's well, I less was, danger. I was going to say that I think that also is a function of the genre because it's a young adult book. Mm-hmm. And not not to say that young adult books all have to have young protagonists but the coming of age or yeah growing into your station yeah plot they're, line. yeah they're they're very much all of the books i think are very much a kind of coming of age story or a coming coming into oneself story yes but that's not what we were talking about we were talking about <laughs> the world building so we, we are introduced to this necromancy concept and we're introduced to this magic divide or this divide between the magical world and the technological world and i love that it goes both ways also magical things cannot exist too far south is it south of the yeah of the border south of the wall it is the it is a wall okay yeah i didn't want to get stardust mixed into my (laughs) (laughs) terminology no it's it's a wall but also things created by technology cannot exist north of the wall and i love that that goes like your ways. your clothing if your clothing is machine made it starts falling apart the further north you travel and the only people who experience that are the male love interests which is also <laughs> <Let's kiss>. excellent <laughs> i um was reading across the wall which is the collection of short stories or a collection of short stories that Nick's published. You really did go all out for this episode. I did. <laughs> I feel like the underachiever student who's like <laughs> chewing gum in the back of class. <laughs> I read seven books in seven days for this episode. But so in in Across the Wall, and I think it's in the introduction to, it's in the introduction to one of the short stories there. I'm not sure if it's specifically the old kingdom story because there's only one of them there but nix talks about how in his world building process he's essentially creating new aspects of the world as he needs them so it's not that he has all of these details set in his head like he didn't he didn't have all of the world details set in his head when he started writing sabriel it's he's he's created these elements as he needs them for the different books. And I think it's really incredible how he's managed to stay internally consistent 
while expanding upon all of these elements. Yeah, that's fucking bonkers. Yeah. Because we are introduced to these elements so slowly, which I really love. Like, you actually get a whole novel to explore each new element, Mm -hmm. which is wonderful. And you really do understand you know the the clare the seers the the future sighted women that was not a sentence or a <laughs> phrase that anyone uses the not true the, there's so many different ways to say it. the clairvoyant hey, so, that's the, the word yeah the, the, the clare can see potential futures in water so in like sheets of ice or icicles or i think frost on a window pane and that is introduced purely in the second book well I'm, as in it doesn't gum up the works of the first book <laughs> yeah it's, they're it's, not relevant it's not yeah it's not relevant in the first book you might we might get a mention of them i don't specifically recall but they they are not detailed in any way until we get to the second book lyriel because she grows up with the claire she is like that's her her bloodline is she is one of the claire only she doesn't have the foresight that they do that pacing though is so incredible. Like from a like a zoomed out perspective, the pacing of the world building as a whole, giving us as readers so much time to really engage with each new element makes me so much more invested in every piece instead of cramming everything the author knows about a world in the first chapter of the book. Oh, I've never been here before. Why don't you tell me about all the stuff in this country? (laughs) Well, in case you didn't know, you know, like, I feel like that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Whereas he really takes his time and knowing that it was happening as it went uh, only baffles me because (laughs) everything fits together so well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that really is quite astonishing, I think. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> so we start with the necromancy then we get the clairvoyance and then i'm thinking of the books in timeline chronological order in which the next one is golden hand but that's not how it works yeah so so by publication date i'm saying the claire are, are books two and three because lyriel and aborson well aborson is really a very direct continuation of lyriel like it it takes place immediately after the end of of lyriel and then Clarial, we get an expansion on Berserkers, which we're introduced to with Touchstone because he has that Berserker um, characteristic or bloodline. But we get a lot more information about that because Clarial is a Berserker. And then in Golden Hand, we meet the Nomads and learn about them. And there's a lot there. Yeah, I don't think there's really anything like that in Tercial and Eleanor, though. Like, I, I think that Tercial and Eleanor, more than the other books, is a pulling together of all of the elements and, rather than an, than an expansion. Mm. But that makes it even better, because then we get a chance to really sort of digest all of these different pieces and see them interact together. Mm-hmm. You know what we have not addressed yet? All of the romance. Yeah. (laughs) I was going to say all of the romance subplots, (laughs) but also yes. (laughs) Yeah. um, All of these books do contain an element of romance to them. And I think they, they all are, one can get past it, but they all are kind of insta love. And it does bother me a little bit, except these books are so good in general that I kind of hand wave it away. Okay. I would call it chemistry at first sight. That's how I would describe these relationships. Yeah, okay. I think that's fair. As soon as these characters, I say these characters because it happens in every book. (laughs) Yeah. As soon as whichever characters are the main (laughs) characters of the book meet each other, they are definitely into each other right off the bat. However, there's still some like tension. They don't get together right away. They still have to overcome the struggles of the book. And it's not usually love conquers all, right? The romance is definitely a subplot for the most part. Yeah, the, the romance doesn't beat the big bad. Like, it's it's incidental to that. But Yeah, sometimes 
the characters who happen to fall in love build a very functional partnership and are therefore able to beat the big bad. But that's maybe cutting hairs, but I think that's different. <laughs> I think that's different. No, I I agree. I I think it's different because it's not it's not that their love conquers all. No. They are a good team. That's why they fell in love and that's why they win the fight. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Actually, different. actually there is one book where there is not insta love. There's no romantic subplot whatsoever. Is that Clarial? That is Clarial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clarial is is ace or the words that I and I don't remember the exact phrasing that they use. They have some kind of odd terminology for it. But I think the real world equivalent is Ace. And I do like that. Is is that good though? Well, I was gonna say I do like that because I like seeing more Ace characters. I do That's not of, why I cringed. I <laughs> for do, the record. Yeah. Yeah. I I know, I, I know. And I'm I'm trying to figure out how to say this without being too spoilery. I will say it sucks that Clarial is the ace representation yeah I like having ace representation yeah but did it have to be her <laughs> yeah and that's all we're gonna say at this point yeah which yeah probably says a lot more but <laughs> whatever it's fine <laughs> yeah no I I do I do agree with you there there's a character who is very into Clarial and it's not that Clarial is well Clarial is uninterested in sex of really any sort but she has had it like like she's experimented she knows that she's just not interested and there is one character who's thinks that she's attractive and who kind of hits on her and she tells him in no uncertain terms i'm not interested in you and then he does it again later on and it's like we're supposed we're kind of supposed to find it charming Mm. but it's it's also like no dude she said very clearly that she just wants to be friends she's not into into you romantically like you should have stopped mentioning. Yeah. yeah. She wasn't playing hard to get. Yeah. Can can we just all, every human being on the face of the planet, agree to never play hard to get? Let's just all agree that right now. And then no one can ever say that they thought that's what was happening. And it would just clear up so much. <laughs> like, let's let's just all, like right now, I'll take an oath. It's not a thing anymore. I just yeah. solved every problem on our planet, basically. <laughs> you, a lot of romantic ones, anyway. Isn't that all of them? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that was... Yeah, that was really not on topic, but yeah. <laughs> I feel like talking about the romantic subplots isn't even a spoiler because it's so obvious. Even if there are hurdles of course and it's not a straight path from point a to point b we know who they're gonna end up with (laughs) from pretty early on in every book also i also feel actually like this kind of goes back to your comment about it being elder young adult Mm -hmm. or what i would call like traditional young adult Mm -hmm. because i feel like in that subgenre really a a romance subplot is, I don't want to say required, but ubiquitous. Mm-hmm. I Okay, I have to clarify that we're making fun of these romantic subplots, but I am so 100% into them every time. <laughs> I don't care that it's obvious. I love the awkward stumbling and, and the cute banter. I am so invested. Uh, it's not a surprise who they end up with (laughs) but I still enjoy the journey I would I would be okay if there was no romantic subplot I'm less into romance than you are in novels I think but I think it works like I still enjoy the books and I still enjoy the, the romantic component but I would also be fine if it was dropped The romantic component does not detract from the book. Yeah. I think is a good way to put it. If it's something you like, it's there. If it's something you're not into, it doesn't interfere Mm -hmm. with the larger story. Mm -hmm. It also doesn't contribute to the larger story. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, I don't care. There is a romantic subplot, and I'm not going to 
go into specifics about it. Because... Are you telling me that Tercial and Eleanor end up together? What? <laughs> God, was... spoilers, Sarah. <laughs> I was going to say that there's a romantic subplot in Golden Hand that I absolutely adore because I think the love interest is great, specifically how she relates to. I would actually argue that the she is the main character and the he is the love interest. Well, okay. Yes. Yes. I think, I think you're not necessarily wrong there. He Um, was introduced earlier, but she gets way more page time. Yes. I guess I, I consider him to be more of a main character because he's shown up in multiple books and this is the first book that she has shown up in either way she's wonderful and the way their relationship starts forming is adorable and i love every second of it we're being very sly because this is literally (laughs) the only one that would be a spoiler to talk about so why are we talking about it right now you're wondering that's because we're about to transition into the spoiler talk but first there are two prequels in this series well that's such a weird prequels are weird hey (laughs) prequels are weird because aren't all of the books prequels before golden hand if you think about it (laughs) no because they all came before it golden hand is a sequel all right golden hand isn't golden hand isn't the original Okay, yes, obviously I was being facetious about Golden Hand, but sequels are weird. I stand by that. Clarial, less so, because it takes place so far ahead of the main bulk of the series, I would say. It takes place 600 years in advance of Sabriel, and it does relate to the main overarching storyline, but uh, much more tenuously than the other books. Well, Tercial and Eleanor is a prequel. (laughs) And I made the joke earlier about how they end up together and how that's a spoiler. And of course it's not because they are Sabriel's parents. And so the fact that Sabriel exists (laughs) means it's not a spoiler that they end up getting together. And it's just, that's, it's just weird. That's all prequels. Yeah. I think, I think Tercial and Eleanor was billed as the story about how her parents get together. So, which it is. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, that not surprising anybody. It's just very interesting reading or experiencing any story when you know how it ends or where you know where it's mm-hmm. going. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it absolutely changes the tone. And I think it's different between a prequel and rereading a series. Because when you reread something, you also know where it's going. But mm-hmm. I, the vibe is different, and I cannot quite articulate why. Yeah, I and again, I mean, as you said, I don't think that I can quite articulate why either, but I think you're right about knowing how something will end. Actually, I think it's I think it's because when you're reading rereading a story, you are seeing the points develop. I mean, yes, obviously you know where it goes Mm -hmm. but you're seeing the points develop that will bring you there Mm -hmm. whereas when you read a prequel that's not necessarily the case for example with Tercial and Eleanor we see their meeting but we don't see the events that lead them to their appearance in Sabriel (laughs) yeah Yeah. so you know the end story but you don't know the in-between and I think that that has something to do with it. No, I, I agree completely. I mean, that's uh, and that's not the case for every prequel, because some prequels are a lot more directly related to the material that follows. Mm-hmm. It's just interesting, and I wanted to bring it up. Did I have an answer for it? No, <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to bring it up. That, that was my entire bullet point in our notes. Prequels are weird. <laughs> You're not wrong. Mm-hmm. So before we move on to the spoiler section, Lily, why should someone read these books? Oh my God, you can't spring that on me. <laughs> you normally spring it on me. I know. You're not allowed to turn the tables. What is this? <laughs> Gosh, okay. It's my prerogative is the older cousin. Oh, fine, pull the age card. It's all right. <laughs> you didn't have to. If you 
want a well-built fantasy world with extremely well-established magic rules that don't bog you down in the nitty gritty this series is for you if you love the ooky spooky undead shenanigans this series is for you especially if you're not super into horror but still kind of like those ooky spooky vibes then the series is definitely for you if i had known you were going to lean so heavily on the ooky spooky i would have suggested we read this for spooky month and saved myself some of the really spooky books. <laughs> the new one didn't come out in Spooky Lump. <laughs> but of course, that's so much of why I love these books. Like the incredibly beautiful world of this death is a river. And each level of death, there's nine. And then each level of death corresponds to one of Aberson's bells and there's so much lore connected and each bell does a different thing but they're all connected with with death and sending the dead back or calling them back to the world well they all all of the bells have an effect on the dead a differing effect on the dead and the living and the living I guess they on on all beings yes and and they also Uh, are associated each with a different level of this river that is constantly flowing down into true death Mm, and when i'm gonna i'm gonna argue there a little bit i don't think that they're the bells are specifically associated with a different gateway in death a different level in death well there's the same number so i'm not wrong I think, I think there are (laughs) there there are parallels but it's not a direct it's not like one bell one has a correlation with the first gate okay yes that's true sorry (laughs) but the the farther you follow this river down the harder it is to get back out and at the very last level if you look at the sky you can never leave because it just pulls you in it's just oh it's so good and this eerie and beautiful and horrifying but not horror It's just this extremely dark exploration of the veil between life and death and sort of playing in that space. And it's very good. And also there's uh, some very cute flirting banter. So, you know, let's throw some of that on top, like icing. (laughs) Also some really fun uh, pet companions, which we have not touched upon at all, but they sure are there and they're delightful. That's why you should read this book. These yeah. books. <laughs> <laughs> if if you want snarky talking cats who are more than they seem, you should read these books. And dogs. And dogs, yeah. Basically, uh, read these books. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize how long they were. The first one's not a huge time sink. The first one being Sabriel, in my I mean, opinion. <laughs> most most of the books I think range from like the 350 to the 450, 500 page mark, except for Lariel, which is 700 plus pages. If you read Sabriel and you don't like it, don't read the rest of them. But when you do read Sabriel and you do love it, I told you so. (laughs) To avoid spoilers for the entire Old Kingdom series, skip to 13640. Okay, so... Can we talk about how I went into the three books that I hadn't read before, not knowing anything about them? I didn't. I mean, obviously, I had the titles, but I didn't look up anything about them. And I 100% called that Clariel was going to turn into Clore, like early on in in that book. And I'm really proud of myself. Swish, nothing but net. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that was a 100% called shot and you nailed it. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, Garth Nix starts telegraphing it and it's he telegraphs it pretty obviously, but still. Yeah, you still called it though. I did still call it. I mean, I don't know how obvious it was <laughs> since you just texted me about it. So I'm just going to take I got the it. For I it. got it before the mask shows up. Oh, so, see, there you go. That, yeah. That's meaningful. <laughs> Can we now admit who we were talking about with our very uh, extremely well-disguised he and she conversation about the romance in Golden Hand? Theron and Sam. 
<laughs> Sam being Sabriel and Touchstone's son. So obviously he's shown up before. He's one of the main yeah. characters. Or, see, he's not a main character. He's kind he's of a, a main character. He's a secondary character, but he yeah. shows up through... I mean, he he shows up in Lyriel and Aborson. Well, he and Lyriel are friends. It's great. Love Lyriel. But Farron is a new character in Golden Hand, and she is incredible. I, were, mm-hmm. oh, I was, I was going to say, I, I liked her as we saw her throughout the book, but I felt that she really shined when she met Sam, and they had all of that banter. Like, she was great, but before they but, sure did have chemistry at yeah. first sight huh <laughs> <laughs> they, they had chemistry at first i i felt like like he really humanized her character because their interplay like it just really made her so much more engaging i mean she was great before but i feel like part of that is just the plot timing right she her character up until that point she was been, very focused previously she yeah. had one goal deliver this message yeah and she happens to meet sam at the same place where she delivers the message message yeah. so she's finally able to be a person and mm-hmm. not just on a quest i mean that's fair but also i really loved farron during uh you know the whole book because there were a couple of times so she's trying to deliver this quest and obviously there are people trying to stop her <laughs> and there were a couple of times where I thought, obviously, you should just do this thing. <laughs> like, why are, why are you going this path? Like, this is this is the obvious easy answer. And I think every time I thought that she attempts it or addresses it and realizes something wrong with it that I wouldn't know because I don't know all the monsters in the world. But, you know, I think uh, the best example is she's taken in by this uh, fishing town or this Karilka, who I also loved, uh, the captain of a fishing ship, and all of her seamen are her children. Uh, but on the sea, she's the captain, not the mom. <laughs> and she decides that they are taking in this, this wounded girl they find, and they're helping her. And they take her back to town, and they're being chased by this ship full of horrifying uh creatures and necromancers out to get Farron but she says no of course we're going to help you uh clearly your message is as important as you say it is because otherwise they wouldn't be chasing you which good for you Karilka that's good logic and she's not wrong yeah so the whole town is running away because obviously they can't fight against all of these monsters and thank god that Farron says well, I should go this other direction because they're not after you guys. They're after me. And so like they, I shouldn't lead them right to you because you guys are a bunch of innocent families just trying to survive. <laughs> so why would I bring them to you to slaughter you? Which I extremely appreciated. And it didn't feel martyry at all. No, uh, it just it just felt like common sense yeah it was practical yeah and they said you know they still sent a couple of people to help her because they still wanted to help her but they also didn't murder themselves saying no we'll die for you every last you know man woman and child it was none of that shit they were like yeah you should go (laughs) because we don't want to every single one of us die (laughs) yeah it felt way more cooperative than i think real life would be but at the same time not unrealistically so if that makes sense i'm okay with it being a little bit too cooperative I when mean, they all make good fantasy. decisions yeah. <laughs> yeah like i'm i'm not i'm not saying that necessarily as a negative just i like yeah that's probably not people people would probably not be that helpful in real life this is fantasy that's fine but at the same time it's not that they're being helpful to the point where I can't believe it at all. Yeah, I I think we see the whole town running away, and then we see a couple of people specifically help Farron. And the town running away is not helping her. They're trying to save their own skins, right? And so that totally makes sense. Yeah, but Karilka but, helping Farron. But also, like, I'm okay also with that. if this was 
and I don't even know why I'm arguing. <laughs> why I'm arguing this. <laughs> this, is, this is fantasy. But if this was real life, I would expect to see people refuse to run away. No, they're That's not going to bother us. You know, we're not doing anything wrong. I don't believe that there are these people coming. They're so, after you. Why should yeah. I leave? Yeah. yeah. I would agree, except I believe that they would be shit fucking terrified of spooky monsters. <laughs> yeah (laughs) i like i believe that random fishing village would go oh fuck (laughs) (laughs) there's a bunch of constructs coming for someone and i don't want to be here when that happens that's true (laughs) that's very true right the threat is strong enough that i'm okay with everyone saying let's put our differences aside and (laughs) run away as fast as we can i mean i'm i'm okay (laughs) with it I didn't have any problems with it. And they kind of address the the younger people kind of thinking it's a game, right? Yeah. And I, I like that. They didn't realize how serious it was. Mm-hmm. And they were still running away, but maybe not uh, comprehending. They also kind of had that mentality of, I mean, you know, it's okay if we have to stand and fight. I when- could take them. Yeah. <laughs> you really couldn't. No, you really couldn't. <laughs> So that, that's not exactly them not cooperating, but that was enough of a conflict. It was a different kind of conflict, right? Mm-hmm. It was a, a motivational conflict instead of a, an action conflict. And I was okay with that. I'm just so glad that Farron diverted the monsters because if she had let that entire town get slaughtered, that would have really sucked. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. We... We mentioned before that these books have more, more, not adult themes. That's a bad word. I don't like the word adult. It handles concepts maturely uh, and does have sort of complex. It doesn't shy away from concepts. Yeah. it. I can't even say it's not black and white because there's definitely bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not really sure what I'm trying to say. But what I'm also trying to say is I never feel bad. Like reading these books. It, it deals with concepts. I felt are... bad when Curl's husband died. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that does suck. But that's the thing, right? Like there are there are moments of sadness that make the book feel real, but you still get a happy ending. I yeah, do like a happy ending. I like a happy ending too. I didn't cry during these books at all. No. So they're not sad in that sense. No, they're sad in the realistic sense. Yeah, I cry at the drop of a hat. So I like Karilka's husband. I have to say, you kind of called it right. I, well, one kind of called what? it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's very obvious he's going to die. Yeah, it's one of the it's one of those things that's kind of telegraphed. But you also hope that it's not actually going to happen. And it is heartbreaking. It definitely put a pit in my stomach. Yeah. And but Farron acknowledges like this this was a, a husband and a father of five, six, many children. A lot of kids. <laughs> yeah. And he he put himself on the line for her, for her message, which I mean ultimately was good. They weren't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was an important message. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it yeah, it's there are somber moments in these books. But the overall story, I would say, has optimistic endings. Yeah, it's it's not like this is a series where no one dies, everyone's safe, mm-hmm. nothing nothing bad ever sticks. Yes, unless it's an animal companion, in which case they're fine always. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's, at the same time, it, it it does have a happy ending, and you can pretty reliably count on that, even in Tercial and Eleanor, where you know that <laughs> that both Tercial and Eleanor are going to die because you see both of those deaths in Sabriel. Yeah. But the book itself, if you look at it as a self-contained uh, story, has a happy ending. I would say that the most this series gets is bittersweet because even the deaths that do happen feel meaningful. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like he's killing off characters just for the sake of killing them off. Yeah, which honestly I like. I know life isn't that neat, but 
that's why I'm reading a book. (laughs) I do sometimes wish that some of the final battles felt like they had more urgency or more immediacy Mm -hmm. because I feel like those can sometimes feel like the outcome is a given yeah in this series but that's a pretty minor complaint overall I'll take a happy ending any day it almost feels fairy tale-esque mm-hmm. we'll get those dark moments but we know how the ending is going to be yeah I feel like there's such a an emphasis on the lead up to the final battles that the final battles are a little anticlimactic. Yeah. I feel like these books are more about the journey than the destination. Yeah. And once we get to that final battle, it's just a function of, okay, we told you how this was going to go because the characters have been preparing for it. Yeah. So let's get it over with so we can get to the smooching at the end. <laughs> yeah. They do mostly end with smooching. They, they do mostly end with smooching. You're not wrong there. Yeah, I'm also not complaining. (laughs) (laughs) I did read Tercia Little and Eleanor, but I was literally reading during meetings (laughs) that I had myself muted, so I didn't absorb a lot. (laughs) I, you know, in a way, I wish that we had been able to move recording back. We weren't for a variety of reasons. It's all your I know it's all my fault, (laughs) Um, but I I kind of wish that we had been able to have a discussion where you had had enough time to read it, because I think that you would have interesting things to say. It'll probably be my good thing I read next week. (laughs) Yeah. I also also think you just enjoy Tercial and Eleanor. I mean. (laughs) I'm going to read it. I'm going to read Clarial too. Yeah. This might shock you, but I kind of like the series. (laughs) (laughs) I won't I won't go through my whole spiel about oh really because I just did that yeah I know but I'm gonna make Um, that joke at least three more times don't worry (laughs) I thought one of the interesting things about Teresil and Eleanor was that this is the first book where we have a main character who doesn't know anything about the old kingdom all of the other books even in the case of Sabriel who has I was going to say Sabriel is less familiar Sabriel is less familiar because she's she's grown up attending school on the Encelstier side of the wall, but she you know she visits her father the Aborson periodically and he visits her, and she studies charter magic and she knows that she's going to be the Aborson so she's read the Book of the Dead so she's familiar with it at least a little bit more than in passing but. Maybe not. She doesn't have a master's degree in it. Um, (laughs) Well, I don't have a master's degree in the United States either. I hope no one Um, holds it against me. (laughs) But Eleanor is the first character who starts out the book knowing nothing. She has a charter mark. First main character. is the Yes, the first main character. She has a charter mark, but she thinks it's a scar. She doesn't know the significance of it. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know any sort of magic, and a big point of the story is her attempts to learn magic. And it felt like in in a series that has five other books and one, at least one short story, I think there are more that are published on his website that I did not read. One short story collection, you mean? No, because uh, the the collection of short stories is not specifically about the Old Kingdom. Oh, okay. There's, I misunderstood then. Yeah, I thought there, you said something about 130 pages. Yes, there is one 137 page book, a uh, page story in this collection of short stories. That's not a short story. That's a novella. Okay, <laughs> I won't. I won't get. I won't get weird about it. All right, let's go. <laughs> okay. I don't. You know, it, it is. It is fairly large print and large spacing. It could still be a short story. It's probably a novella, but it is. It's definitely on the line. Okay. That's that's neither here nor there. <laughs> that's not what we're debating today. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it brought a fresh perspective to a series that you would think would be kind of, I don't want to say hard done by, but... but There's quite a few books yeah. in this world. And so being able to find a new angle, 
even mm-hmm. even in a series of books where we have had fish out of water characters before mm-hmm. it still manages to bring a fresh perspective mm-hmm. yeah and eleanor is great i liked her a lot it was also nice to see tercial being an abortion and waiting who's not that confident in his skills that's true because when we see him in sabriel he's dad <laughs> mm-hmm. he's, he's he has all the answers dad yeah yeah he is uh it's a everything is okay now tercial is here mm-hmm. instead of you know the the unsure not coming of age coming into their own yeah is what i'm going to insist on calling it even though i know that's the same thing <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the phrasing that I used earlier, so I'll allow it. Yeah. But And and he makes mistakes in Tercial and Eleanor, and he kind of fucks up. And he and I think he is at least indirectly responsible for some of the deaths early on in that book. If he had been a little more sure of himself, I don't think that some of Eleanor's servants, companions, found family... <laughs> Would have died. Side characters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think Tercial and Eleanor, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it. It did feel like a story of less competent characters. Mm. Or characters who are coming into their own in terms of their belief in themselves. Which is definitely a change from the rest of the series. That's true. Even when we see... Well, I would say Lyriel is less in the know because at least Sabriel knew she was going to be the Aberson, right? Lyriel doesn't know what she's doing, but she is confident that she can do it. Right. And Whereas yes. I think that Tercial knows what he's doing, but he's not confident that he can do it. Yes, I agree. Okay. Yeah, you nailed it. That's what yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was also very fun because we get to see Mogget, who is the talking cat character, Except that he's not in his cat form. So it was a very it was a very different Mogget. I love Mogget so much. Mogget is great. We get hints in the other books that Mogget has had other forms. Mm-hmm. And so actually seeing him take that form is mm-hmm. I don't think it was so that okay. Why is a prequel different from rereading something? Well, you're getting new information, even if it comes out to the same end of the equation but i I don't think mogget would have been as charming in this book if i didn't know him as the talking cat oh yeah no 100 percent agreed mogget would would not be charming in this book if you didn't know him as mogget it's I, i don't need the knowledge of this book but i need to know where it's going in order for me to enjoy this book. Mm -hmm. I don't think it stands alone. Or at least Mogget doesn't. I think as a story, you could read it without having read any of the other books in the series, but you would be doing it a disservice. I think it benefits from the knowledge that you have from having read the other books, or at least from having read Sabriel. At least, at least from having read Sabriel. I think that's a good point. You don't need to, you don't need to do like 14 books of homework in order to enjoy <laughs> this book. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's definitely a prequel. Yeah. The high points shine when you know the background information. Mm-hmm. And it's also interesting because this book pulls in a lot of information about characters that we have seen in previous books, I think that essentially all of the characters who show up, all of the important characters who show up, maybe not some of the schoolgirls, but the main villains are all related to previous books. AKA future events. (laughs) AKA future events. The, The one Claire who shows up is or the two Claire who show up we see in previous books aka future events <laughs> and so your your enjoyment of what's happening is really deepened by your knowledge of who these characters are in the future I agree completely hey you had a comment earlier 
I do have a little bit of a problem with both of the prequels being Clarial and Tercial and Eleanor. Which is one book, even though that sounds like three different book titles. (laughs) Yes. And I'll stop complaining now because that's very fussy. (laughs) It's not a, it's not a main, uh, a major issue, but I almost feel like these prequels are too pre, right? (laughs) Like, I want to see, I want to see Clarial as she is turning into Clore, not Clarial at the beginning of her journey. And I want to see Tercial and Eleanor in the events that lead up to Sabriel. Not, I mean, I enjoyed seeing their meeting too. Like I would, I think for Tercial and Eleanor, I would like two books about them. I want their, mm-hmm. I want their meeting and then I want their ending. Mm-hmm. But I, I was just really interested in getting the intervening time. And mm-hmm. we didn't, we didn't get that whatsoever. Like when I started thinking that we were getting that Clariel was going to be Clor. I thought that it would end with us knowing very concretely that she was Clor, and that's not what happens whatsoever. So yeah, we don't get to see it at all. Yeah. I say extrapolating from your comments because I do not actually know. I mean, we I think I think we see the seeds of the Genesis, but mm-hmm. we don't act we don't actually see anything. And it's it's implied in a golden hand that it doesn't actually happen for another like 50 or 60 years. That would be such a good story. Right. Like, right. Show me her downfall. That's what I want to see. I I wanted to see once I, once I realized that that was who she was, I was like, I want to see her fall. I don't want to see her beat her, her baser inclinations because I know that ultimately she doesn't. Yeah. It feels like a cheap victory. Mm Mm-hmm circling back a little bit this is also why we were complaining or at least why I was complaining that Clariel is the ace character because she also ends up being the big bad yeah that's that's not great representation I mean she's a good character but I like that there's ace representation if you don't know that she turns evil (laughs) if you take Clariel as a standalone and ignore the context of the rest of the series then it's great well, and but. it's okay for ace characters to be evil because ace people are humans and some humans are evil. But if she's the only one, it's a little yeah. bit yikes. I don't think that we've reached a point of ace representation saturation just in general where the one ace character in a series can be the evil character without having wider implications. I I didn't feel like it had implications. It just felt a little no, ham-fisted. No, I guess I don't. I don't mean impl- I don't think that Garth Nix is saying that ace people are inherently evil. Like that's no, not, like that's not what I'm saying. Okay, this isn't Dune where the <laughs> Harkonnens were specifically evil because they're gay. Yeah, because <laughs> like, they're gay and fat. Yeah, that's an example of it. Yeah. being no. done very bad. I think this is not that at all. <laughs> no, and, and I don't. I don't mean to imply that, but. I, it's just unfortunate. That's yeah, all. It, and, and I guess what I'm saying is that it wouldn't be unfortunate if we had a level of representation in the wider world, not specifically within this Old Kingdom series, but in, in the wider world of fiction. Mm-hmm. We had enough representation where it was commonplace. And, you know, you could say, yeah, sure, this character in the Old Kingdom is ace and evil, but there are there are a handful of other or there are plenty of other characters in these other series who are not that. And you just have a, a wider representation. I mean, yes, my argument would have been if he had just thrown in any other ace character, <laughs> then it would have well, been OK. That, that too. Because that's in his control. Like yeah. for an author, one author cannot control the larger body yeah. of works in our culture today. So how could this one work have been fixed literally any other ace character (laughs) yeah no and and i i agree there i just mean if if garth nix is not changing a thing about his series this is how it would have been okay if right the wider context was different i and i it doesn't feel bad in in this story right it doesn't feel like she's evil because of that or anything 
it only feels bad because of the context. Yeah. <laughs> I think this might be something that ages well when we get more ace mm. representation and then we look back and go, but there's so much representation now. It's okay. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe not. You're I making mean, faces at me. Yeah, a little bit because so much of her character and I think a lot of her aceness is wrapped up in her wanting to be alone. Mm. But that's not how that works. That's not how that works. Yeah. So that feels a little... mm, Simplistic. Simplistic, stereotypical in the bad sense of the word. So I'm not entirely sure that it would age well. I think Garth Nix is trying. I, I think, I think that it's coming from a place of respect and not like trying to be rude well i haven't read clarial i can only go off of your comments <laughs> so i don't actually deserve to have an opinion <laughs> in this conversation but i'm gonna have one anyway to me it sounds like it was inconsequential this is a character who has characteristics one of which happens to be that she is ace yeah i i think i think yes i agree i think that i would appreciate it more if the other aspect of her character was so less about wanting to be alone. That does feel like a bad and, combo. And those those two, her aceness and her wanting to be alone are not necessarily tied together in the narrative, but but they're very heavily implied to be it's, together. But it's also the implication. Even if yeah. this book didn't mean it that way, that's still how it reads. Yeah. So I think... I, I like the representation. A for um, effort. Yeah. A, <laughs> Try a again effort. next time. <laughs> I, I like the representation. I would have liked for those two things to be less hand in hand. I also would have liked for there to be more ace rep than just the character who turns evil. Yeah. Um, I personally feel like that would go a long way. Again, uh, speaking just from a what can one author do? Yeah. Because the one author writing a work cannot control the larger culture that they're writing in. But by having other characters that have similar characteristics, it lessens the implication that all people are like this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I want the next abortion story to be about an ace abortion. Yes. But her sidekicks have to have a spicy romance because it can be both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she can have she can have siblings or parents or friends who have a romance. That's fine. Just give me or he, well, he or she. I mean, I'm always happy to have a female main character <laughs> or they or they. Uh, we didn't record the very long cover co- cover art conversation <laughs> where I just went off on how much I love how androgynous Sabriel is in the cover that I own of the book, which is not helpful to anyone listening, which is also why we didn't have it on air. <laughs> it also is maybe very exposing of my preferences. <laughs> it's such a good cover though. I love it so it is much. A, it is a good cover. Something about the Aberson and the main characters, previously she but we're expanding Nick's Nick's world <laughs> for him. I guess I guess Terciel was a he, but that was the prequel. That doesn't count. We all know that. I mean, there are there are plenty of male abortions. Yeah, but not that we've seen. We see one in Clarial. Okay. He's not a he's not a main character. He is the guy who is interested in Clarial and hits on her twice. This is a ridiculous (laughs) argument. Why? Like, (laughs) I love that we're seeing Lady Aberson's, and I love that it's not weird that there's Lady Aberson's. Uh, Like, this is not an argument that we should be having. (laughs) I mean, I don't. I don't even know what what you were trying to argue. I was just saying that. Yeah, there there are male (laughs) abortions too. Oh, we we were building the next story where. The main character is the Aberson, and his or they or her sidekicks are the ones with the spicy romance. And I was just going to yeah. riff off of that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but we, we like that way we'd get the main character, a good guy main character who doesn't mm-hmm. turn evil, who can be ace from whatever I think, gender. I think I think we should have a female ace abortion 
and a non-binary secondary character romance. I mean, yeah. Give yeah. it give it all to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> yeah. I would read that shit in a second. <laughs> Pretty much. All right. So we're just going to, uh, instead of publishing this episode, we're just going to send it straight to Garth Nix and say, <laughs> congratulations, we wrote your next book. Now you do all of the actual writing part and get back to us. <laughs> I bet he would be thrilled. Really, we just reinvented fan fiction, so. Yeah, this is, this is at least the back half of this episode is just us writing abortion fan fiction. Yeah, well, and this was also Crystal's point in our, one of our many conversations <laughs> with her. <laughs> We've had we've had a few conversations with her regarding romance. Uh, and whenever we bring up fan fiction, it always comes back to representation and mm-hmm. how fan fiction sort of fulfills that gap, right? Mm-hmm. This is what we want to be seeing in these characters, not even because what we're seeing is bad, but because we want more and we want other and we want new. I do immediately regret using the word other because that has a lot of baggage. But you, of other than what currently exists, is what I meant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that got the point across. <laughs> I think I think that did. I should also point out that the crystal that Lily mentioned is, of course, Crystal Matar, author of Spiffbo finalist Legacy of the Bright Wash, and just all around wonderful person. Well, and incredible author, and an incredible author, excellent fan fiction analyst. <laughs> That's not a word. <laughs> analyst. <laughs> <laughs> I do like analysis though. <laughs> I do like analysis. <laughs> yeah, that's her new title. Anal analister. No, analysis. Analysis sister. Because then we get that sister in there. Yes. It's good. Uh it's as good as some non-binary romance in the next Aberson. Thanks, Garth. Okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> So as you may have noticed, (laughs) Sarah and I pronounce Aberson very differently. We briefly mentioned earlier that I think she's the correct one, but that is not going to change the way I pronounce it (laughs) because I am purposefully mispronouncing this word for the sake of clarity. Anytime I try to describe this book to people, they get very confused because they think I am saying abortion (laughs) i think i think that is a statement more on your friends because no one that i have ever explained this series to has ever had that comment you ever said oh i'm reading abortion and they're like what nope i have not i have not had that experience (laughs) well it's not the only word i purposefully mispronounce although it's maybe one of the only words i mispronounce for the sake of clarity versus the sake of goofs (laughs) oh wait can we retcon can we say i mispronounce buffett for the sake of uh clarity or goofs or maybe hilarity let's go with hilarity Uh, i think that's that's gonna track better let's let's say that wait can we delete last week's episode and do this instead (laughs) you can just just edit it so that that whole um pet peeve words are weird is just cut out it doesn't it doesn't have it (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I definitely mispronounce words on accident, but there are some that I mispronounce on purpose. Aberson is one of them, for the sake of clarity. There are a couple of fantasy words that I mispronounce for clarity. (laughs) Poor Dan Fitzgerald has an entire series of books called The Mare Cycle that I insist on saying the Mayer, so it doesn't sound like I'm saying mayor. It doesn't matter to anyone else except me and (laughs) I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> speaking speaking of Dan, he actually had a tweet today that kind of relates to the conversation that we are having. His tweet was, please consider pronouncing popsicles as if it were a Greek hero. I am going to say popsicles for the rest of my <laughs> life now. That's the best thing I've ever heard in my life. He also mentioned that he pronounces chamomile or chamomile as chamomile. (laughs) See, purposefully mispronouncing words is one of the purest joys in life. (laughs) Uh, And not for clarity. That's a whole different thing. But I am 
absolutely going to say Jamali from now on and Popsicles. Oh, what if what have I done for myself? I know you have to put up with it forever I'm, now. I'm gonna be the one who suffers. I do often say Jalapeno <laughs> <laughs> for no reason other than it makes me laugh. For clarity, that is jalapeno. <laughs> In case that I, uh, wasn't obvious. <laughs> I hate it, but also I understand wanting to say things that makes you laugh. So I'm happy for you, but also I hate it. <laughs> Why do you hate that, but not Chamomile? I hate Chamomile too. Oh, oh, so you're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't, okay. I don't hate it when Dan says it because I don't have to listen to Dan saying it. That's actually very fair. <laughs> the concept can be funny without wanting to put up with it forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I, I am in a long-term partnership with someone who also says quesadilla <laughs> as a joke. See, that's the problem with purposefully mispronouncing words. <laughs> Is that then you have a conversation with someone who doesn't know you and you say, oh, I need more jalapenos on this. And they look at you like you're a monster. <laughs> <laughs> How do you explain? No, 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 no. I, I know it's jalapeno. No, I'm, I'm not being rude. I promise. It just makes me giggle. Y- you kind of can't. This reminds <laughs> me. Oh, God, I'm not going to be able to find the link. This reminds me of the Ask a Manager post about the person who thought that there was some... Joaquin. Yes, Joaquin. (laughs) (laughs) Who who thought that Joaquin and like Joaquin were were two different people. Wasn't it from (sighs) the perspective of Joaquin and he didn't know how to correct the person who thought it was two different people? No, I don't think so. I think okay, it was, I okay. think it was from the perspective of the person who who thought it was that name referred to two different people. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I I didn't have I wasn't going anywhere beyond it reminds me of that. That's the problem, right? Like well, especially frankly with jalapeno, like that's a Spanish word and so I'm definitely an asshole for mispronouncing it on purpose. But it is funny. <laughs> I mean, as long as you don't mispronounce it to like people outside of your friend group, I feel. Yeah, that that feels like a slippery slope argument. <laughs> I mean <laughs> I would say it's there's a difference between mispronouncing jalapeno and mispronouncing someone's name. <laughs> well, there's there's definitely there's definitely that too. But I think that one can mispronounce things on purpose to be funny with friends, not mean funny, right? Like that's that's the difference. You're not doing it to be mean. Mm-hmm. My my point is that's so context specific. It, yeah, it's it's very if I context slip specific. up, I become really shitty really fast. <laughs> yes, yes. I don't I don't think we're arguing there. <laughs> In my defense, I do it with French too. Uh, like I'm not making fun of the Spanish language. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all languages. But that's important context that uh, most people don't have, which is why I need to be more careful <laughs> <laughs> when discussing jalapenos. <laughs> well, now it's context that everyone who listens to this podcast has. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> You're all in the inner circle now. So uh, when you visit, should we make some chamomile hot toddies? No. We can make some chamomile hot toddies. If you insist. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We're on Twitter and Instagram at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at fictionfanspod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. Thanks again for listening and may your villains always be defeated. Bye. Bye.